Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 23 of Ben Franklin's World the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. Each week, we sit down with an historian to discuss their unique insights into our early American past so we can learn more about who we are and how we can affect a better future. So four early American historians walk into a tavern. The first historian studies how the Anglican Church went from being the established church before the American Revolution to being a disestablished church after it in the Chesapeake region. The second historian investigates how ordinary citizens participated in politics in revolutionary Pennsylvania. The third historian spends his time exploring the phenomena of history culture and the role it played in revolutionary America. And the fourth historian, well, she studies the process by which early Americans in Albany, New York, develop their American identity. So what happens when these four historians get together? Well, we have a fun, interesting, and varied conversation about early American history. In today's episode, we chat with three young, promising historians of early America, Michael Haddam, Roy Rogers, and Ken Owen. All three scholars blog for the Junto, a group blog on early American history, and podcast as regular panelists on the Junto Cast, a monthly podcast on early American history. I am a big fan of the Junto blog and the Junto Cast, and I think that you would really enjoy them. Therefore, I thought it would be wonderful to get Michael, Ken, and Roy on Ben Franklin's world so they could tell you all about their blog, podcast, and historical research. So this episode is a bit different in that we talk about many aspects of early American history instead of just one. In today's episode, Michael, Ken, and Roy will reveal the story of the Junto blog and the Junto cast, how they got started with it, and what types of history articles and episodes you can expect to find there. Information about what aspects of early American history they are studying, and the early American history books they recommend to all of their friends and some of their students. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Michael, Ken, and Roy. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Today is a Ben Franklin's World First. We are joined by not one, but three guests. Michael Haddam, Kenneth Owen, and Roy Rogers. Bloggers and podcasters for the Junto blog, a group blog on early American history, and the Junto cast, a monthly podcast about early American history. Michael Haddam is a PhD candidate in early American history and a teaching fellow at Yale University, where he is writing a dissertation about history culture in colonial and revolutionary America. In addition to being the producer of the Junto cast, he has written for numerous websites and recently appeared in a three-part television documentary series, The American Revolution. Finally, he has also been a research assistant at the papers of Benjamin Franklin. Kenneth Owen is an assistant professor of early American history at the University of Illinois at Springfield. He is fascinated by the extra-governmental institutions of town meetings, county committees, nominating conventions, and general revolutionary rabble-rousing in Pennsylvania. Ken is revising his dissertation, Political Community in Revolutionary Pennsylvania, 1774 to 1800, into a book manuscript, which has been provisionally accepted for publication by Oxford University Press. Roy Rogers is a PhD candidate in American history at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, better known as CUNY. Roy is working on a dissertation that looks at the separation of church and state and the role of politics in denominational formation and religious competition in the early national Chesapeake. Welcome to Ben Franklin's world, gentlemen. Glad to be here. So I have listed all of your illustrious titles. Ken, you're an assistant professor. Michael and Roy, you're PhD candidates. 
Roy, would you briefly translate what these academic standings mean for those of us who do not understand the academic world? Well, Ken's position is much easier for non-academics to understand. Ken uh, is a, your boilerplate college professor. He's re, uh, researching his book and writing his book and teaching graduate or students, uh, undergraduate students every semester. Michael and I's status is a little bit more difficult to understand uh, for non-academics. We uh, are PhD candidates. We're finished with our actual coursework in graduate school. We're no longer going to classes every semester. Instead, we are at least nominally writing our dissertation full time, hoping to complete that project uh, in the foreseeable future instead of working on coursework. But of course, P PhD candidates, doctoral students, they do much more than just write their dissertation. We, we have to do teaching and other things to uh, help pay the bills before we can leave graduate school for uh, other positions, either in the private sector or in universities. Well, we wish you luck, both Michael and Roy, with your continued <laughs> studies and your dissertation work. Thank you, Liz. So all three of you are early American historians, bloggers, and podcasters. And you run this fantastic blog called The Junto, which is a group blog about early American history aimed at both early American historians and for non-historians who are just interested in early American history. Michael, would you tell us about the idea for where The Junto came from and how the blog got its start? Uh, sure. The, the idea and the initial execution of the idea came from Ben Park, who at the time was a grad student at Cambridge and is now a postdoc at the University of Missouri. And this was, uh, I guess, the summer of 2012. Ben recruited a few people, some he knew personally, others he knew online. And then those of us who had joined up early suggested other potential members. And by the time we were done, we had 18 original members uh, spanning a pretty broad range of interests and specializations. And I mean, I did a lot of the work in setting up the blog itself, the layout and whatnot. And eventually we launched in December of 2012. And I have to say that it, it wasn't only a brilliant idea on Ben's part, since there was a huge hole in the sort of history blogosphere waiting to be filled. But the crucial part was really the execution. It's really no small challenge to coordinate any kind of endeavor among 18 people. Uh, but he helped turn it from an idea into a reality and set it up in a way that for the most part, uh, lets the blog largely run itself. And it got off to a fast start and the momentum really hasn't stopped two and a half years later. Yeah, and in two and a half years, it seems like you've grown. It seems like you have way more bloggers than the original 18. And I wonder if you could tell us, you know, how big you are today and what kinds of articles we can expect to see on the Junto blog if we were to visit earlyamericanists.com. Right, so since, uh, since our 18 original members in the last two years, we've added four new members um, and the blog, I think, re really is kind of unique in the history blogosphere. We cover a lot of early American history, and we do it in a broad range of ways. So some of the things that we're best known for is our annual March Madness tournament, which, uh, which we did last month, uh, roundtables on the work of important historians, interviews with historians. We do historiographical pieces. Uh, we cover academic conferences and generally just early American digital and public history. And we also maintain listings of conferences and uh, fellowships for early American scholars. It's really a kind of clearinghouse in that sense. But I think that maybe the most amazing thing about it is that uh, early on, it was recognized and promoted by major institutions in the field and by uh, more established scholars. And so through the blog, we've helped create this platform from which uh, junior scholars and grad students can speak to the field, which really isn't something that's ever existed before. But I would say that while academics are a big part of our core, core audience, we also have a lot of pieces, many of our most popular pieces, in fact, that try to engage a broader audience like you, like you mentioned, Liz. So I did a post about what it was like to play Assassin's Creed as an early American historian. Roy did a very popular post about Columbus Day. Uh, and Jonathan Wilson did a very popular post about uh, looking at all the one-star reviews that Pulitzer Prize-winning history books had received on Amazon. So while it is an academic blog, uh, some of us try to use it as a platform to engage a broader audience. And in a very real sense, I think that's uh, a big part of why we ended up starting the Gento cast. And I was impressed by your Assassin's Creed post because I made Tim buy that video game, but I can't play it because I can't walk and shoot and jump at the same time. Neither can I, Liz. Don't worry about it. <laughs> the most fun part for me was uh, walking, uh, just taking the character and walking around New York City. I, I let my son play it until it got to the point where it, 
the game was at 1776 in New York. And then I basically took the controller from him and was like, let me just walk around. <laughs> and how well done was it? Were you impressed? I, I, I was very impressed. I was very impressed by just the, the I mean, the, the experience of playing it, the experience of sort of walking around 1760s Boston, 1770s New York. But I was also impressed with um, the, the way the game tried to to take on some of the uh, more complicated questions or aspects of the revolution. Uh, so I, I was generally uh, impressed overall with the game. So you call, you, you know, both of your digital media outlets, the Junto blog and the Junto cast are named after the Junto. How did you come about picking the name the Junto? I think that's Michael's call. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm kind of responsible for that. And I think um, uh, at the time I had, I was working at the Franklin Papers and I had been there uh, for about six months. And so I very much had Franklin on the brain. But it seemed to me that it was that it was actually um, uh, apropos, I guess, in a way, because it, it was a it, it was a group of uh, graduate students or junior scholars uh, coming together to, to, to and effectively to, to crowdsource uh, what they knew uh, and to engage each other and people beyond the just the members, um, you know, in, in discussions that could help, you know, uh, be sort of self-improving as it were professionally improving it uh in our case so i think you know it's not just that it was that, that i constantly had franklin on the brain at the time but i think um i think it, it reflects sort of the the a sense of of what the group is about so you're all podcasters on the gento cast which is a monthly podcast dedicated to early american history ken as the host of the gento cast would you tell us about the podcast and what topics you cover in episodes <laughs> Sure. I mean, the main idea behind the podcast was that as professional historians, we are constantly engaged in conversations with each other, whether that's at conferences or in seminars or just within our own departments or um, even over social media. We're constantly talking to each other about how we interpret the past and what we think about early American history. And yet the main way that we produce stuff is to write it and generally it's something that's written by a single author that there's a a single point of view that's put across and yet really that's not the way that a large amount of what we do actually takes place and so the hope with setting up the podcast was that we could find a means of engaging people with the kinds of discussions that we have as professional historians and that we could introduce the debates and a lot of the vibrancy and the energy of those debates um, to a broader audience by portraying it in this discussion format rather than by coming out with something that's claiming to be considerably more authoritative. Um, now, of course, to achieve getting across that sort of debate, we've got to give our listeners a strong understanding of the themes and the events that we're actually talking about. And so in every episode, we start off by talking about um, the main theme or the main event and giving a brief historical introduction before getting into how the three of us and our guests perceive that topic. So... With the different themes that we choose, what we try and do is we try and pick a theme that covers a large swathe of early American history, normally spreading from the colonial period through the revolution into the early republic and the first years of the 19th century. So we've done episodes on things like religion in early America or gender in early America or our last episode, um, which was on loyalism in, in early America. Alternatively, we pick um, events in early America. So we've done episodes on the Constitutional Convention, on the Continental Congress, the Declaration of Independence. Uh, and we've also started trying new episodes where we discuss some of the most important books on early American history as well. And the idea behind the way that we approach that is that by covering these things over a long period of time, we're not just 
giving some insights of our knowledge of early America as a field, but we're also trying to get across to listeners how to improve their own research and how to engage with the sorts of questions that we as early career historians are grappling with in our own work. And to that end, it's been really, really nice when we've heard from people who've used the podcast in college classrooms and in high school classrooms as well to know that that sort of approach is beginning to find something of a wider audience. So I think ultimately what we're trying to do is take both our professional expertise and our enthusiasm about early American history and find a way of combining that to engage a, a wider audience with the sorts of things that we do as early American historians. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that one of the one of the benefits of listening, especially for a general listener, is, is that I think after you listen to a, a few episodes, you, you probably begin to develop a better sense of what kinds of questions historians ask um, and, and how they think about them. So the podcast really is not only about disseminating knowledge, but it, it I think it actually also helps develop listeners' historical thinking skills. So you're kind of like mini graduate school in a podcast. That's funny because Ken constantly says that uh, it, it's the podcast should be like the conversation that happens afterward in a in a bar or a pub a- after a graduate seminar. <laughs> there you go. A lot more family friendly, though. So if, yeah, the, yeah. if you guys were all in one place, where would the Junto cast cast go? Which pub would they go to? What city? And, and let's pick the American Revolution period. What city and pub are you going to? Now, you see, I'd make a claim for Pennsylvania and that we should go to a tavern somewhere in Philadelphia. Uh, but I suspect <laughs> that I might have pushback from Michael in particular on this. Uh, yeah, I, I think when I, uh, in my mind, I probably picture us at the Merchant's Coffee House in New York City. And why, why the Merchant's House? What is special about it? Well, I mean, it, in a sense, it's a place about knowledge circulation, right? Information circulation. So, I mean, in a sense, it, it, it sort of, I think it sort of fits what we do. Sure, because people didn't necessarily subscribe to a newspaper, but the coffee houses certainly did. So you could go there and not only have a conversation with people, but read newspapers and not just from New York City, but from from all over the British Empire, right? Right, absolutely. And, and not not even just read them, but but heard them read aloud. Right. So in some sense, it, 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 you know, it carries that sort of aspect of the, of, the, of the podcast as well. A colonial podcast in a coffee house. The, the equivalent. Those, I, you can imagine those conversations being the equivalent of what we do now in a different setting. So you're all young scholars conducting exciting new research in early American history, and we would love to know about your projects. So, Roy, let's start with you. You once had a research interest in military history of the American Revolution, but now you're interested in religion in the early Republic period. Would you tell us about your dissertation research and what made you switch from military to religious history and from the American Revolution to the early Republic period? Well, as like all historians, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the prehistory of the history of my uh, where my project comes from. I've always had a, a very big interest in uh, the history of religion. Uh, from I was always asking historically minded questions in Sunday school growing up, and then throughout high school, I went to Catholic high school. I enjoyed the church history classes that we were required to take, and all through undergrad, I took uh, a lot of classes with historians of religion. Uh, what, although when I began my uh, PhD, or excuse me, my master's cor- uh, coursework in at George Mason University, uh, just the way things shook out, I ended up uh, having to work on military history topics, and I always had a, an interest in loyalism, and uh, I, I did some work on loyalists, and then I ended up working for the Patriots of Color project, uh, which was sponsored by the du- uh, Dubois Center at Harvard. And uh, the work that I did ended up contributing to uh, a searchable archive of African-American patriots uh, that's now available on archives.com. But then when I got into PhD school here at CUNY, uh, I was sort of tooling around, I guess you could say, for a topic. Uh, And I, right when I was finishing my master's coursework, I had read a book by Thomas Buckley called uh, Church and State in Revolutionary Virginia. And it made me ask a question that's very central to my dissertation, which is what happened to the Anglican church slash the Episcopal church uh, 
the new name for the Church of England in the United States after the American Revolution, after the American Revolution. Uh, so much scholarship was focused on what uh, evangelical religion, Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, and how they sort of succeeded and became the most popular religious groups in the new United States, particularly in Virginia. And sort of the older church that had been the official Christian religion of the Commonwealth sort of disappears from the story. And I asked my MA advisor, what happened with this? And he sort of said, well, there's a little bit of work, uh, but not very much. And here's what you should take a look at. And I took a look at this work and a lot of it is really good, but it just really didn't answer the question of that transition is what, how did this formally established church uh, become dis disestablished and then reassemble itself into a denomination on equal footing with evangelical religions uh, that were succeeding in that time. And that's the story that my, my dissertation is trying to tell. It's trying to explore the political and legal process of how a formerly established church reassembles itself into a denomination that is competing on equal terms with other ones. And it compares the experience of the Episcopal Church in Virginia, experience of the Episcopal Church in Maryland. And the reason why it's in the early republic is simply because the story goes into the early republic. I my my first love is is the is the 1780s, the end of the American Revolution, and the, up to about the Constitution, and that's really uh, where I like to spend most of my research time. But I found as I was researching my dissertation, I had to take my story sadly into the 19th century, into the real early republic. Very interesting. And Michael. Would you tell us about your dissertation and how you came to your research topic? Sure. Well, my dissertation explores history culture in colonial and revolutionary America and how it changed from the colonial period to the decades immediately following the revolution. And by history culture, I basically mean the entirety of all uses or uh, representations of the past, especially specific historical memories of the past of events or individuals. So, you know, how is history understood? How is it used? Uh, what kind of access to historical knowledge did colonists have, elites and non-elites especially? Uh, what role did it play in the culture more generally? And so, um, I mean, generally speaking, I argue that colonial culture was fundamentally historicized and that historical memories of the British past shaped colonists' perceptions of their own contemporary uh, political situations. And then I go on to explore the emergence of an expanded history culture in the early republic that went way beyond just works of history into poetry and drama uh, that helped create new historical memories that not of the British past, but of the American colonial past, and primarily to justify the revolution. When this also uh, led to, you know, the, the institutionalization uh, of this newer history culture with the creation of the nation's first historical societies. So, I mean, in a nutshell, I'm, I'm concerned with how understandings of the past influenced the way people in the 18th century understood their present, particularly politically speaking, and how those understandings were structured and developed and how they changed over time. And I came to the, the project uh, from some work that I was doing on the 1750s in New York City, actually, um, where uh, I, was, I was working on the, the debate over the founding of King's College. Uh, which was quite a virulent debate. And it, it struck me as I was working through these primary sources, just how much their perceptions of the conflict that they were in uh, was shaped by how they understood uh, the 17th century British history. So whether that the Civil War in, in Britain or um, 1688, the way that they thought about those past events were really shaping how they were viewing the conflict that they were embroiled in in 1750s New York City. And basically it expanded from there. Boy, Roy and Mike, you have some really interesting books in progress or just, you know, in your dissertations, and I can't wait to discuss them. And Ken, you also have a book in progress. But before we talk about it, we have to know, how does an Englishman <laughs> born and raised end up studying the American <laughs> Revolution? And do English schools really call the revolution the War of American Rebellion or the War of Revolt? Well, the first <laughs> thing is to note that English schools really don't teach the revolution. Wow. If you're taking the 18th century and the 19th century in British history, there are far more exciting things to be talking about, <laughs> such as, you know, kicking Napoleon's butt. Um, 
it's not something that's covered much at all. And if English schools do cover American history, it's much more likely to be the New Deal or the civil rights movement. It's very rarely the revolution. Um, so, so the fact that I became interested in the revolution at all really owes an awful lot to a trip that I took to Philadelphia when I was about 15. Um, and I was with my parents and we went around all the historic sites. I mean, I was a history nerd. My mum had been a high school history teacher. And we went around all these sites and it was certainly very inspiring to be right in the midst of everything that was going on. Um, but at the same time, we were getting this very strong nationalistic story about the sort of the official public history version of American history. And the cynic in me knew that this story was far too convenient to be correct. Uh, I didn't know why it wasn't correct. And so when I got back to the UK, I wanted to spend a lot more time doing it. And so my my final piece of high school coursework was about the Constitutional Convention. But it just seemed way too convenient for me that 13 such diverse and disparate colonies could end up having such a universal and linear process that pushed them towards independence. And I was really interested in looking at what structures and they used and how they managed to overcome such really quite significant differences. And it seems like you've carried on this work into, into graduate school and beyond because you know, you seem very interested in the rabble or ordinary citizens of Pennsylvania and the way that um, political activity shaped the early republic. So would you briefly tell us about your research and what experiences of Pennsylvania can tell us about the rest of the new United States? Um, absolutely. So when we were talking about where the Junto cast would, would actually meet, I mean, my spiritual home in early America is the Pennsylvania State House Yard which is the yard that's immediately behind Independence Hall if you go there today. But at the time, that was the main public square in Philadelphia and would fill up with thousands of people at times of immense political debate. And I guess that's sort of the best icon for the way that I look at the process of the revolution in Pennsylvania, because it's literally right next to the institutions of government. It's right next to where the Pennsylvanian government meets. It's right next to where the Continental Congress and the Constitutional Convention meets. And you kind of require those people to be on your side if you want to be able to get political change to happen in Pennsylvania during this period. So my approach is very much to look at the way that the activism of ordinary citizens links these sort of loose notions of popular sovereignty that exist throughout the 13 colonies and creates mechanisms through which the people are then able to transmit their desires and their own interests and get some impact on the more formal channels of government. Um, you also asked a bit about why I focus particularly on Pennsylvania. And I think one of the reasons for that is that Pennsylvania is comfortably the most diverse state in the new nation um, in terms of ethnic divides, in terms of religious divides, what today we'd call class divides. And also there's a very significant difference between East and West in Pennsylvania as well. And that means that there's a huge number of differences that political movements have to try and overcome if they want to achieve anything on a state or a national level. And I think that by looking at the ways that people engaged with these institutions of ordinary citizen power, the town meetings, election campaigns, and civil disobedience and outright violence, I think if we look at the way that those meetings and committees are formed and are intended to work, we can see the way that you try and create some sort of 
way in which popular sovereignty isn't just something that's asserted, but is actually something that comes to be foundational in the way that government operates. You know, just by listening to you three describe your projects, we have really gotten a good feel for the diversity of information that is represented not only on the Jinto blog, but in the Jinto cast as well. Now, you have somewhat of a following among Ben Franklin's world listeners, because when I posted a call for questions for you and Poor Richard's Club, the private Facebook community for Ben Franklin's world listeners, I received a few questions. So Roy, on occasion, April hears an argument that the founders wanted the United States to be a Christian nation and that its laws should reflect a Christian worldview. However, the Bill of Rights states Congress is not allowed to create a state religion. April would like to know what the founders and those involved in the discussion of state religion thought about non-Christian religions and religious freedoms in general. Well, April, thank you very much for that question. It's a really great one. It's also a massively complex one that uh, is not only just politically contested as anyone who pays attention to uh, when religious topics are debated in our public sphere today, but also among historians. Uh, And there's also another problem with identifying what the founders thought about these questions, which is if there's one thing when you read a little bit, even just a little bit, about the world, the religious worldview of the founding fathers, both famous ones, uh, you know, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, uh, Ben Franklin, uh, to less famous ones like John Jay, uh, they all have very diverse religious beliefs. So none of them have sort of a set of shared religious principles that you can argue all of them, all of them shared. You can, though, as a general rule, say that most of them were opposed to the sort of official brands of Christianity that existed in many states during and immediately after the American Revolution. Uh, they, they, they wanted to establish a system of religious faith in this country that individual individual conscience would be the central organizing principle that you wouldn't be obligated in your tax dollars or uh, through other legal penalties to attend or support one Christian denomination over another. The problem was uh, many people uh, who who don't fall into the bracket of being founders that we remember, many common people uh, disagreed with that perspective, and they wanted uh, to maintain their traditional churches that had had such a dominant cultural and religious presence. This is particularly the case in New England, uh, and to a lesser extent, the uh, the area that I study, Virginia and Maryland, the Chesapeake. Uh, so that's actually where the First Amendment uh, is really a compromise on that question. Uh, it makes it so that the Congress cannot establish a state religion. There will never be a Baptist, official American Baptist church that every American from sea to shining sea is supposed to worship at and get supported by our tax dollars as federal taxpayers. But uh, the way in which the First Amendment was originally uh, thought about was that it would give space for individual states to both have a religious uh, establishment if they wanted to, an official church or not. And uh, when the First Amendment was adopted, m- many states did not have an established religion, and a few did. In the, 19, in the late 19th century and early 20th century, that began to change. Uh, it began to be, there is a legal process called incorporation, which began implying the Bill of Rights to the states. Uh, that is a, it's a broader historical question. Uh, than what you than what uh, you're asking here, but uh, for the period that I study, uh, the First Amendment only applied to the federal government. Now, the one thing that most of the founders that we think about, and and most common people at that time thought, is they didn't necessarily think of the America as a Christian nation in the way in which people today do. Instead, they tended to think of the new United States as a nation of Christians where Christianity would not really be official in a, na- in a national sense, where every American would be obligated to be sort of one type of Christian versus another, but that most of the population, an overwhelming majority uh, in this period, would be Christian, and that Christianity should have a legally privileged place. Uh, it's, it's sexual mores, it's 
political mores and regulations should have a privileged place, but that not necessarily should we come out and say that America is a Christian nation where Christianity is the only thing welcome here. And that was not the case. Non-Christians were welcome in the new United States. And you see this very uh, famously in a treaty that the Adams administration signed uh, with Muslim countries uh, in an, uh, in North Africa, that specifically said that the United States was not a Christian nation; that Muslims would be welcome in in uh, in the new country. So uh, this is a very quick, even though it may not seem like it, very quick overview of a very contested subject, and it really was an excellent question, April. Was that a John Adams treaty or a John Quincy Adams treaty? It was a John Adams treaty. You know, with father and son presidents like that, we just have to double check. Yep, that just but that just shows my bias towards the uh, the, the late eighteenth over the early nineteenth century. <laughs> yeah, the only Adams that matters to me is John without the middle name. The Treaty of Tripoli. So Ken, April was also interested in your research. She notes that Pennsylvania was one of the most diverse colonies, and she'd like to know how that diversity affected the politics of the colony leading up to the revolution. Did the Germans, Scots, Irish, and other immigrant communities get along in the backcountry? And was the revolution a uniting period, or did people just generally get along before the, the revolution? Well, I think the thing that's most important to note about Pennsylvania is that there was almost never a time at which there wasn't at least some conflict that was going on in its politics. And we can go right back to the 1680s to find that, that even when the population was largely Quaker, there was a huge schism within Pennsylvania called the Keithian Schism um, that really divided and drew political lines quite sharply. Um, then in the late um, in the late 1600s, early 1700s, there's a lot of animosity towards the way that William Penn wants to govern the colony, and that's what leads to the 1701 Charter of Liberties, which is one of the most prized documents within Pennsylvanian history, certainly in terms of Pennsylvanian identity in the 18th century. Moving later into the 18th century, with regards to the Germans and the Scotch-Irish in particular, um, I guess the pedantic note on the Germans is that there are a lot of different types of Germans in the Pennsylvanian backcountry. Um, there are those who are pacifist, who are largely happy to accept Quaker leadership, um, but there are those that aren't as well. And the question of talking purely about a German community can be a bit misleading. Um, as far as the Germans and the Scotch-Irish go, the important thing to note is that there's many things that unite them as well as there being many things that divide them. So in one sense, they're very hostile towards the colonial authorities because they've been forced out into much more marginal lands and they've got hostilities because they feel that they're being unprotected against Native American attacks and they've got hostility because they feel that their interests aren't being looked after by the colonial government, not least because the colonial government deliberately reduces or deliberately keeps their representation in the colonial assembly pretty small. Um, so in the one sense, there is a vaguely Western identity or a vaguely backcountry identity that can be associated with some of those ideas. At the same time, often those ethnic groups are in conflict with each other over land um, and over resources and over what minimal access there is further east. And so that can lead to quite a turbulent um, state of affairs as well. Something similar is actually going on in, in Philadelphia. There's very strong um, disputes that are going on in, in Philadelphian politics in the 1740s, 1750s, particularly with regards to the status of the Penn family as governors of Pennsylvania and whether that's something that's desirable. And so really right throughout the 18th century, we see some very turbulent goings-on within Pennsylvanian political and social life. The second part of the question asked about whether the revolution acts as a uniting factor, and I think the answer to that is a resounding no. You know, Pennsylvanians 
politics in the in the revolution is remarkably contested to the extent that when the 1776 constitution is ratified opponents of the constitution make repeated attempts to try and block the implementation of the constitution including denying the legislature of a quorum in 1777 which is at a time when there's a potential invasion of Pennsylvania that's going on. You know, the, the politics are incredibly keenly fought and incredibly bitter during this period. So the interesting thing that I think comes out of that, and this goes back to my answer about my research questions, is why these mechanisms are so important. It's very clear that there are sharp political divides, even if you only look at the active patriot community within Pennsylvania. There are incredibly sharp divides about who participates that are divided along those ethnic and class and religious and um, sectional lines. But without the mechanisms of popular politics that have been developed during the 18th century and then are sort of thrown into the revolutionary crucible at the, at the end of the 1700s, without those processes, without those mechanisms, without that practice of politics, Pennsylvania could have been a real basket case. And that's why we need to look at those institutions quite so carefully to see the way in which those different tensions play themselves out. Well, and let's keep on the theme of the American Revolution. You may have watched the Sons of Liberty series that recently aired on the History Channel. Chris wrote in and he said he noted that many historians have voiced, voiced unfavorable opinions about that series. Michael, can you tell us briefly why historians seem less than thrilled with the portrayal of the American Revolution by that television miniseries? <laughs> well, I, mean, I don't think it's a secret that the series had many uh, significant historical inaccuracies. I mean, not least of which was Sam Adams uh, appearing 10 years younger than he really was. I mean, a paunchy 40 year old Sam Adams is not hopping rooftops, Assassin's Creed style. Uh, and that said, if you look at the series website, they, they say on the website that the show is, uh, quote, historical fiction. But I think that the problem was that the statement was buried on their website and wasn't made clear in the actual episodes. Uh, and that led a lot of viewers to think that what they were watching was historically accurate. And I know that firsthand because I saw a lot of them saying such uh, on Twitter while they were watching it. And um, I think another thing that historians uh, had a problem with was how individual based the narrative was. I mean, Sam Adams seems responsible for the revolution itself in Boston. And I mean, I agree with historians. That's a problem. But. You know, uh, we should also recognize that our cultural memory of the revolution has, uh, from the very beginning, been based on individualism. Think of the earliest artwork, right, by John Trumbull and, and other painters and, and of the earliest accounts of the revolution and those early sort of mythological biographies of uh, revolution leaders, especially George Washington. And then even in more recent times, you know, you can think of uh, David McCullough's John Adams book, but the HBO miniseries. And the Hamilton play that's that's going on right now, that's about to go to Broadway. Uh, so that focus on individuals is nothing new. And in that sense, the series is very much in line with our traditional cultural memory of the revolution. But I think many historians, at least those who don't have a problem with focusing on the revolution in the first place, thought that, you know, if you're going to focus so heavily on individuals, you could at least take care to be as accurate as possible. Great. And while we're on the topic of accuracy, one question that I am often asked is what do I think the best books in early American history are? So now I'd like to ask you guys, what do you think are the best books in early American history? Could you tell us like your favorite book in early American history and perhaps the best book about early American history that you've read lately? Why don't we start with you, Roy? Well, my favorite book and the book I always, uh, recommend to uh, my friends, who, uh, my lay friends, my friends who are not historians who are interested in sort of understanding what historians think about early American history would be Alan Taylor's American Colonies. It remains uh, the best overview of the colonial period leading into the American Revolution. It's clearly written and just 
is just a really great example of what historians writing for a popular audience could be. The best history book that I've read recently is actually a very old book that we uh, are reading for a future JuntoCast episode, which is I went back and reread uh, Ed Morgan's American Slavery, American Freedom, both for my own dissertation research and for the podcast episode. And it just remains, even though it was written in the 1970s, just a really fantastic book about the intersection of economic inequality, race, and class in the United States. That's fun. That's actually one of my favorite books in early American history is Ed Morgan's American Slavery, American Freedom. It's just unbelievable. It's amazing just uh, how productive uh, Morgan was capable of being throughout his life as a scholar. And what about you, Michael? If you're interested in the revolution and maybe you've read a, a number of popular books about it, but you want to go further into understanding the questions posed by the revolution, uh, there are these two books by Alan Gibson. Uh, one is called Interpreting the Founding and the other is called Understanding the Founding that I think are really good introductions to the, the sort of scholarly debates of the last century, uh, especially Interpreting the Founding. That's, that volume is especially good for non-academic readers. And I think, you know, I'm often asked if, uh, to recommend one book about the revolution to sort of non-historian, just like Roy is talking about. And I usually suggest um, uh, either... Uh, Benson Bobrick's Angel in the Whirlwind, which is a fantastically written single volume narrative of the revolution, or or actually Gordon Wood's Modern Library volume that's just called The American Revolution. I think that reading the two of those together is actually an excellent introduction to the story and the major themes of the revolution. And I mean, if I if I had to suggest another one, I, I'd probably suggest either Ed Morgan's Birth of the Republic as a good introductory volume or even uh, John Butler's Becoming America. And what about you, Ken? Yeah, um, I will second Michael's praise of Becoming America by John Butler. Um, I don't necessarily agree with everything in the book, but I think it's a really elegantly argued and broad-ranging way of looking at 18th century America. And I think it sets up a lot of different issues that perhaps general readers wouldn't have come across before in a in a really elegant way. Um, I'm going to pick a an older and a more recent book rather than going in your categories of favorite and best. Um, in terms of an older book, I would recommend people read Gordon Wood's Creation of the American Republic. Uh, I think that gives a really good overview to a lot of the key themes in the political development of the American Republic. And although it's received a lot of criticism for perhaps concentrating a little too narrowly on the thought of elites, one of the things that I think the book does really well is looks at the way that the different states tried to interpret the more dominant national ideas. And I think that a, a careful reading of the book gives people a really good understanding, not just of what's going on in America as a whole, but also the difference between the different colonies and states in terms of the way that they interpreted a lot of those different ideas. Um, in terms of a more recent book, one that I enjoyed an awful lot was Francois Furstenberg's in the name of the father, which is looking at the image of George Washington after his death. And although I'm not sure how much I'd endorse the overall argument of the book, the first half of the book in particular is absolutely fantastic. And it's got a wonderful chapter on the use of Washington's farewell address in American political culture in the early 19th century um, that builds on the way that Washington's funeral was portrayed as well. And then there's another chapter that goes into a great amount of detail on Mason Weems' biography and the story of the cherry tree and all that, and really looks into why Weems was constructing Washington's character in the way that he did in the largely fictitious biography. And I think there's... A general reader would get a a real amount of interesting information they'd never have considered before about someone who seems so familiar. And our listeners have actually heard from Francois Furstenberg because he was in episode 17 and talked about when the United States spoke French. 
Mm. Liz, can I add one more book? Because I can't let Ken and Michael get away with recommending two Gordon Wood books without uh, <laughs> suggesting that interested readers uh, check out uh, one of my favorite books to teach and one of my favorite history books and what I think one of the most insightful history books uh, about the revolution its aftermath math, which would be Woody Holton's Unruly Americans and the Origin of the Constitution, <laughs> uh, which is very well written. And it makes a, if you want to really understand how historians in the 20th century and early 21st century have debated the American Revolution, it would be really useful for you to read the work of Gordon Wood alongside the work of Woody Holton, because you'd have two scholars, really excellent scholars, interpreting the same events and the same ideas in radically different ways. Well, thank you for adding to our reading list, gentlemen. Uh, now we certainly have a lot of books to look out for and to, and to look forward to reading. But now it is time for the Time Warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future but they can speculate about what might have been. And this week's time warp question is basically, it's selfish, because I've been thinking about this question. I would like to know, in your opinion, what might have happened if Parliament and King George III had accepted and allowed official voting representatives from its British North American colonies in Parliament? How would early American history be different? And since I'm feeling really generous, I'm going to let you guys have a whole 60 to 90 seconds each to answer this question. <laughs> so, Michael, why don't we start with you? Well, that, I think well, I think that is an interesting question. How, however, I, I think that whether or not Parliament had accepted allowing colonial representatives uh, into Parliament probably wouldn't have mattered because colonists did not sincerely want that, I don't think. A few colonial leaders pitched the idea very early on in the imperial crisis, but uh, most colonists and I think uh, most of the of the leaders knew that representatives in parliament wouldn't solve the problems as they perceived them. And that's because a few colonial representatives among hundreds of mainland MPs would really have no voting power whatsoever. So I, I always think that this specific argument about colonial members of parliament was primarily rhetorical on the colonists' part. And I think that if Britain had offered it for real, that colonists probably wouldn't have accepted it. But even let's say they did accept it, I suspect that the arc of the imperial crisis probably would not have changed at all. Uh, I think a few colonial MPs couldn't have stopped the Townsend duties or the Tea Act or the Coercive Acts. And so those pieces of legislation that really propelled the imperial crisis uh, pro probably would have happened anyway. And how about you, Roy? I think that even with some nominal representation of the colonies in Parliament or in, in Britain more directly, uh, I still think the same sort of tensions that led to the American Revolution would have just boiled over again. It may have been two generations later, it may have been three generations later, it may have been when the Commonwealth itself was actually beginning to be established in the late 19th and early 20th century. But I think that the big historical difference would be there would, the status of the United States as a country would be much closer to Canada and Australia's status than the fiercely independent, fiercely non-Anglo-American United States that we have today. We'd be, we would be Canadians, basically, is, I think, uh, where we would end up. And Ken, do you think if King George III in Parliament had allowed voting representatives from its British North American colonies in Parliament, that perhaps you would have learned more about the 18th century than you did in English school? Um, I doubt it. <laughs> um, I think the one thing that would have been incredibly tricky about getting American colonies represented in the British Parliament would be how restrictive the British Parliament was in those days. Um, in particular, thinking about property qualifications and also religious qualifications as well. You know, both of those things would have caused really serious difficulties for actually integrating the American colonies into Parliament. And what you probably have found if it had been attempted is that it would have restricted the 
politically active within America. And that would almost certainly have ended in in more violent rebellion, possibly even quicker than than when it did erupt in 1774. Um, the other thing that I think might be interesting as a comparison would be thinking about what happened with the Irish question right. and how that came to dominate British politics in the late 19th century in particular. So what is the Irish question? So the the Irish question was whether Ireland should be granted home rule. There was a rebellion in 1798, the Wolf Tone Rebellion, that actually picked up on a lot of American revolutionary ideology. And that ended up leading to the Act of Union, which forced Ireland to be represented in the British Parliament. And then by the end of the 19th century, there was an increasing movement, not just from Ireland, but also within um, within mainstream British parties that wanted to see home rule for Ireland. And I think that something like that would have developed very, very quickly, that there wouldn't have been sufficient American voice for American grievances to be heard in Parliament. And so trying to find some other way, whether it be colonial assemblies or whether it be something like the proposed plan of union that Franklin put forward at the Albany Congress in 1754, I think that would very quickly have become the primary demand of American colonists. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that uh, you already had some colonists calling for essentially the colonial equivalent of a parliament. Right. Which is which is it would effectively be a form of uh, home rule. And if that had actually happened, then I think you, you you probably would have seen a significant change to the to the subsequent narrative. If I think going back to the question about the, the colonists in parliament, I mean, the, the main change that I would probably think you would, you would have seen if that had actually happened was primarily rhetorical. That is, they would have had to the colonists would have been forced to drop the representation argument. Right. Because it would it would really no longer be valid, which was the whole purpose of even uh, considering allowing colonial representatives into parliament. So you would have seen this rhetorical change whereby uh, the revolution, uh, I suspect, probably would have still happened. But uh, children in American schools would have been deprived of that uh, easily rhyming slogan that they get. Yeah. And I think that. The other thing is it would have really highlighted the difference between the British and the Americans over representation. The, the right. British still believed in virtual representation. Right. And if you're going to have MPs from several thousand miles away, basically you're only ever going to be virtually represented. And something that is much more direct, which has been the American colonists' experience for, in many cases, close to 100 years or even more, um, it just wouldn't have washed. There, right. there would have had to have been a conflict over that. Right. I mean, the other the other thing to consider is had they allowed colonists in the parliament, uh, how that might have affected uh, internal uh, British imperial relations. Right. If you if you let colonists from the, the mainland North America into the parliament, uh, you know, that sort of changes the political dynamic within uh, the empire. And then there's there could be all kinds of questions raised about how things proceed from there. I wasn't expecting such agreement, but uh, those are definitely interesting <laughs> food for thought. And I hadn't really considered the idea that the revolution might have happened sooner than it did. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. So before we conclude, would you tell us what is next for the Jinto blog and the Jinto cast? Can you perhaps give us a preview of some future articles or episodes? But the way that the Jinto blog is run, um, it's not it's not really run with that much foresight. So it, it's it's not always apparent what's in the pipeline. Uh, as for the Jinto cast, uh, we have an episode coming up, uh, our March episode, which uh, will be out after this. But before uh, I suppose it's released, uh, will be on Edmund Morgan's American Slavery, American Freedom, which we've talked about. Uh, and then we have an episode in April coming up on the American Revolution, sort of in conjunction with this um, major conference on the American Revolution being hosted by the Massachusetts Historical Society. Uh, and that conference is in April and the, the podcast will sort of talk about uh, issues that were raised and uh, questions about the revolution going forward and how to 
how to really uh, revive revolution studies. So if we want a preview of American slavery, American freedom, we will tune into your podcast. And otherwise, we'll just have to stay tuned to the blog and uh, subscribe to it via Feedly or, or whatnot to see what's coming up next. Absolutely. So where is the best place to look for more information about you, your work, and how to get in contact with you? I will certainly list links to the Junto cast and the Junto blog in the show notes. But what about you personally? Ken? Um, I have a personal website at kenowin.wordpress.com and that gives a lot of information about my work and how to contact me. Um, alternatively, if you look at the history department website at the um, University of Illinois Springfield, which the main website is www.uis.edu, and you can quickly find the history page from there. That's got more information on how to get in touch with me as well. Roy? Well, I have a professional website at royrrogers.com, uh, which has a link to my dissertation research, uh, my teaching experience, and ways to get in touch with me. I'm also nominally on Twitter, uh, but my Twitter account, uh, which is at uh, FauxIntel, uh, is mostly used for Junto links and cat photos, so I'm not quite <laughs> sure if... Uh, your audience would be super interested in that. But if you are in the greater New York City area and you're interested in meeting me and listening to the sort of topics that both are discussed on this podcast and on the JuntoCast, uh, the CUNY Early American Republic Seminar will be hosting a conference on May 1st uh, all day that's being keynoted by Seth Rockman, who is an excellent historian uh, from Brown University. And it's open to the public. It's free to attend. And uh, there will be a nice reception. And Michael... Hadam will also be presenting at that conference. So if you Indeed. are in the greater New York region, you should really uh, come out. Great. And we'll include a link to that conference and the details about it and to your cat and Junto tweeting Twitter account <laughs> in the show notes page. And what about you, Michael? Uh, well, my, I have a website too. Shocker. Uh, it's uh, michaelhadam.wordpress.com. That has uh, all kinds of information about my research current research, former research. It has conference papers that I've delivered, uh, talks that I've given, uh, and things like that. Uh, and then, of course, you can find me on the on the blog. You can find me at Twitter at Michael Haddam. Ken Roy, Michael, thank you so much for joining us and giving us a behind the scenes look at the Junto and, you know, the interesting history that you're working on. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us, Liz. We really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, thanks a lot. The similar but different historical interests of Ken, Michael, and Roy provide a glimpse of the diversity of historical work and viewpoints that you will find on the Jinto blog and discussed in the Jinto cast, both of which you can find by visiting earlyamericanists.com. You can find more information about Michael, Ken, and Roy, the Jinto blog, Jinto cast, plus all of the books they recommended on the show notes page for this episode. You'll find it all at benfranklinsworld.com slash 023. Also on the show notes page, you will find a link to episode 14 of the Jinto cast. Admittedly, this is my favorite episode because it discusses popular protests during the American Revolution. Well, that and Michael, Ken, and Roy invited me to be the fourth panelist in that discussion. Did you enjoy this episode and the varied conversation that it offered? Please let me know. I thought it would be interesting to see whether you might enjoy a different style of conversation from time to time. The conversation we had today offers a glimpse of what four historians might talk about if they get together at a conference or even socially in a tavern. Your feedback will help me determine whether or not I should repeat some of these experimental episodes like the one we had today. Please send your thoughts to liz at benfranklinsworld.com or tweet me at Liz Covart. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.